in listen only mode. Hello and welcome to today's program, Buy, Build or Both, Investing in Analytics That Last. I'm Dave Rubenstein, Editor-in-Chief of SD Times. And uh, before we get started, I have a couple of quick housekeeping announcements. Uh, first of all, there will be a live Q&A session uh, at the end of the presentation. At any time during the presentation, you can ask a question by uh, navigating to the questions pane in the control panel, typing it in, hitting submit, and we will get to as many as time allows. Uh, but all of them will be answered either uh, during the presentation or afterward. Uh, secondly, the recording itself of today's presentation will be available on demand on the sdtimes.com website, uh, usually in about 24 hours after the, uh, after the event, so you can listen to it on demand over and over again to your heart's content. Uh, today's topic, build versus buy. Boy, that's a tale as old as time, isn't it? Uh, but today's program is going to look at both sides of the issue, and uh, we uh, want to leave you with some good information as you work through your decision-making processes about whether you should invest your own um, people's time and energy in building something uh, that may or may not be a fit, or going out and buying something, and what the downside of that may be as well. Uh, today's featured speakers uh, are Nat Venkatraman. He's the Director of Product Management at Logi Analytics, and he's responsible for the Logi Analytics platform. Uh, and also joining us on the program today is Michael McLaughlin. Uh, and he's the Director of Data Analytics Services for a healthcare IT provider called CPSI. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Nat to get us started. Thank you, David. In today's webinar, we will explore the options of building versus buying functionality in a software product or application. So here's how, what we'll do in the agenda. I'll cover the different considerations that go into this decision before handing it off to Michael. Michael will discuss his experience in this area at CPSI, and we will then summarize the discussion before opening up the floor for questions. So let's get started. As David pointed out, this is a question as old as time from the software perspective, uh, build versus buy. Uh, and what I'll do first is uh, start by defining these terms. So build is a process of adding a software feature by actually developing the functionality. So as part of this definition, you may use open source or commercial components, but the key point is that the organization doing the building is using significant development resources to writing code for the business Examples of features that you might want to build in your product are things like charts, tables, maybe some forms, or some customized workflow that's unique to your application. On the other side is buy, and buy really achieves the same goal. The difference here is that there's a built-in framework for that business logic, which reduces the development effort, and the need to have that domain knowledge in the topic uh, that, that you're working with, uh, or both. Uh, so things that people typically buy are things like a database driver. Uh, so that's something that you commonly see people uh, purchasing rather than going and trying to build their own database drivers. Uh, commercial analytic tools is another one, and that's going to be pretty much the focus of all the examples I use. Uh, I'll just add one more point here. The example I gave earlier of charts is actually very interesting because it really blurs that build versus buy decision. You can, of course, build your own charts, or you could buy a full third-party library. In many cases, though, the chart use case is simple enough that uh, depending on how you're doing the development, you still have to do work uh, in terms of connecting to the data, the binding the chart components to the data, programming behaviors such as clicking on, on part of a chart and navigating to a different page and all these things. So even though you may have bought a chart component, you're still using resources to do further development. So which is why it, it leans more towards the build side of the equation. So let's uh, uh, talk about the analytics use case. So to show the various considerations that distinguish build versus buy, uh, I'll be using analytics as a representative feature set. I'm really using a very broad definition, a definition of analytics. So analytics, I'm, the way I'm using it is something that helps you visualize and interact with the data, such as charts, tables, reports, dashboards. It could, it could also include more complex functionalities, such as self-service, forecasts, predictions, and many other things. So there are many reasons why analytics is really an excellent use case to illustrate the difficulty of a build versus buy decision. And this is really a very difficult decision. I see this all the time uh, with, with, my, with, our, with our customers. Uh, analytics requirements are typically driven by management. Uh, the reasons can be manifold, such as um, customer requests, 
competitive reasons, revenue reasons, but whatever the reason, this for forces a certain urgency in the organization to implement this functionality in a timely manner. Since the requirement is typically tied to revenue, the entire company is, is vested in this functionality. So in our surveys, uh, we have found that revenue is a main motivator for analytics adoption by independent software vendors or ISVs. So uh, the analytics use cases, in addition, can be simple or complex, uh, thus making the functionality a great example of having to choose between build, buy, or some combination of the two. To illustrate this further, a simple use case of analytics added to an application is a little little chart you see every time you look at a product in Amazon that tells you how other people have reviewed this product. This is analytics, and it is very amenable to the build paradigm. The, the requirements are really straightforward. The chart component is cheap or available through open source, and the workflow for the user is really straightforward. So contrast this with a complex use case where you enable dashboards, reports, self-service, allowing users to directly access data, investigate it, create their own charts and dashboards, share them, socialize them with other users. This really requires a lot more knowledge about business intelligence, um, and it's a much more difficult proposition to build. Uh, so yet, uh, companies often, often have requirements and use, use cases where the buy option can be just as challenging for, for uh, complex use cases. So really, analytics is a very good area for us to explore that build versus buy dichotomy, as well as to look at alternative options that leverage the best of all approaches. Uh, as an aside, um, just in case you're interested in knowing more about how companies embed analytics in their software products, I recommend you download the 2017 State of Embedded Analytics Report. Uh, this includes a survey that we conduct and provides a lot of information, uh, interesting information and statistics on how companies incorporate analytics for the users to consume. So let's look at um, all the stakeholders uh, and considerations. So let's say you're a product manager or developer and you have to add analytics to your software or application. Uh, who and what do you care about? So your stakeholders can broadly be broken into the following categories, uh, business, product, uh, product meaning product management, and development. And by the way, these three can all be the same person for in smaller companies. Um, so a business stakeholder is typically a member of the executive team. And what that stakeholder cares about is whether the functionality is core to the business, how much it costs, and whether it provides a competitive advantage. A product management stakeholder cares about time to market. So how quickly can I take the product to market? What are the requirements for the functionality that, that I, I, I need in, in my product? Uh, what is the ultimate go-to-market strategy? And what's the overall UI, UX of this integrated product? Because presumably the analytics is revealing something in conjunction with, with another software product or another, another page or another screen. Or, or application. So uh, the development stakeholder really cares about what are the skill sets required by the functionality, uh, how are these staffed, uh, what are the tools, what are the languages they have to use, and how do you integrate this with that parent software or application where you're now showing analytics. So let's start with the business considerations then. So from the business perspective, you really need to consider if the functionality is core IP to your business. So for example, uh, you are in the oil and gas industry, and you have uh, you're building some software that helps you better identify petroleum or natural gas deposits. Now, this is really if that's your business, that's really core IP. So, because you have to incorporate your your own domain knowledge for the analytics that make that software work. Uh, on the other hand, if the software reports uh, on efficiency of wells, the amount of gas extracted, revenue, profits, all those things, every one of these things is critically important to, to the business but is not what I would consider core IP. So uh, if the feature is your core IP with your domain knowledge and everything that you know incorporated inside it, it is better to build. Next, uh, let's look at uh, the total cost of ownership next. So the, the, the cost is absolutely critical uh, for most companies. And in general, for complex functionality, the build option requires significant development resources. Uh, moreover, the cost of maintenance of the software is also high, so going over several years, the majority of the, of the cost of developing software is really in the maintenance phase. That's uh, uh, quite anecdotal, but uh, I, this is something I, in my experience I've seen uh, being actually fairly true in the business. Uh, in general, the buy option is going to be cheaper as you need significantly fewer resources to achieve the same results. So one of the questions you might wonder is, why on earth would anyone build uh, if the cost is going to be uh, lower? And, and there are many situations where that might happen. For example, let's say the cost of the feature, in this case analytics, let's say it's substantially lower than the overall cost of the product. 
there are also companies where they prefer to build. That's just in the DNA of the company. That's that's what they like to do. And uh, for them, build would work, would work better. Otherwise, it may cause friction among their teams and all that. So there are several reasons like this where companies might elect to build. Uh, but generally, when it comes to the total cost of ownership, uh, it leans more towards the uh, the buy side of things. The third item from the business perspective is uh, whether the functionality provides a distinct competitive advantage and it differentiates itself from your competitors. So if there's functionality that provides tailored capabilities for your specific product and workflow, and it is substantially different from what is commercially available, you, yeah, you may have no choice but to build. Uh, if, if it's something like mature functionality, analytics and reporting, in general cases, I'll say buy is better. But if, if it's something that's distinctive, that that's provides a, uh, something that your competitors don't have and cannot have, then you, you are better off building. Let's look at the next uh, category, or the next set of stakeholders, uh, the product managers. So product managers view the build versus buy equation in a different way. So their focus is on building the right capabilities and getting that to market. Uh, so their interest is in things like time to market, requirements, go to market strategy, UI, UX, things like that. So let's look at each one of these. The first one is time to market. And this one is actually pretty easy. This one almost, almost always favors buy, especially in the complex use cases. So given that the broad capabilities are already built out for the feature, you end up having to focus mainly on the integration and the deployment of this functionality. So uh, build is only an option if you have flexibility on the timing and you can roll out these capabilities over an extended period of time. Otherwise, if it's, if it's time to market, it's typically almost always uh, buy, buy would be the better choice. The next set of things is uh, around requirements. So if you look at your requirements, uh, if they're complex or need specialized knowledge, Buying gives you some a distinct advantage, uh, especially in analytics, and probably very true for many other fields. Uh, if you're embedding analytics into your software or application, then the build option requires you to know a lot about the business BI field. So you need to know business intelligence, and there's a lot of nuanced knowledge around data modeling, schema, aggregate awareness, and many other things that you need to know. In such situations, uh, buying is, is a better option. Uh, of course, if the product in the market is is may may, it may not be mature, may not if 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 what if what you're trying to build uh, is pretty unique and there's not enough products out there, uh, or they're not mature enough, you may have again no choice but to build in that situation. Uh, the next one we look at is uh, the UI UX piece, and uh, if there are specialized workflows that you need that are unique to your application, and if the functionality you're offering has to be tightly integrated with the rest of the software. Uh, and by this, I mean, uh, you want things to appear completely seamless. You're going through a piece of software or application and your users don't know where the analytics starts. If, if you're providing analytics or something else, you want it, want it to be a completely seamless experience in terms of the workflow, uh, you may be better off uh, with a build option. Uh, this one is kind of a borderline thing though, though because I will cover uh, another option, which we typically call buy, buy and build or a hybrid option. Uh, where you may be able to achieve the same result uh, after you buy uh, certain products. And this, there are certain products that are more attuned to this kind of capabilities. Um, the, la the last piece I'll talk about for product managers um, is going to be around uh, the, the go-to-market. For product managers, uh, go-to-market, or GTM, is everything to do with the release of the product that is not re related to the actual development and QA of the product. So this includes things like release notes, sales messaging, documentation, competitive messaging, training, and a whole host of other things. So typically, when you buy a product capability, uh, when you're doing the buy, when you have the buy option, a lot of the helpful material around documentation, training, and messaging is already available for your use. So you actually get a head start. So this one, it really tilts more toward the buy uh, side of things. Uh, otherwise, if you were to build all this, you'd have to start, fr start from scratch and do everything uh, from scratch. Uh, the, finally, let's look at the considerations from the development perspective. Uh, the development pr uh, team typically has to worry about the skills required and what's available in the team, what are the resources in the team, the technologies that are being used, and how well the functionality integrates with their software or application, because ultimately that's what they're selling. The analytics is an add-on. So let's start with skills. Uh, the question here is very similar to the one we ran into on the product considerations slide. Uh, to build complex functionality, functionality like business intelligence into your product, your team needs to have that skill set and knowledge available. And this is not really that common with most development teams. So 
if it, typically you need to know if it's databases you're connecting to or web services, you'll need to know the backend pretty well. You need, you need to know how to build out the right kinds of, of querying, querying mechanisms, uh, the security, the authentication, the authorization. So a lot of stuff that you'll have to build in. Uh, and in, this, in these situations, a buy is generally the better option. Now, if, if you have the skill sets and, and the time, then of course the pendulum then tilts back towards build. Uh, let's look at the next one, manpower or resources. So as a development team, you have to ask yourself this question. Are you staffed for this functionality? So do you have sufficient resources to build the software or would you be better served by buying it? So uh, what is your opportunity cost for this functionality? So what's the work in your core IP you'll have to pass as you have to move resources to enable the building of this capability. And based on this uh, consideration, the recommendation is typically to go and buy. So another concern for the te development team is what technologies are used in this feature. So if you want full control, uh, or if you have, want to have a reasonable amount of control or, or a sizable amount of control of all the technologies in your software, you may be better off building. So you typically can't control what so technology, what components your software vendor, vendor is using uh, if you're going through the buy option. Uh, again, this is one of those things that, that, that the build plus buy option, the buy plus build option actually helps with. So there's some use cases to be said about a hybrid option where you buy something, uh, but that it helps you uh, uh, overcome these objections. And finally, let's look at integration. Uh, so the question here is, are there complex integration challenges with the parent software? So are there unique pieces of software you need this functionality to connect to and to work with? So in situations where the parent software is complex to connect to, for example, or has workflows or pieces that are not uh, amenable to integration, uh, let's say you have a legacy system and uh, it's, it, you can't integrate that easily to it and uh, make everything seem seamless. Uh, you may be better off building. So rather than try to find a vendor who has that capability or, or write a lot of custom code, uh, you eventually end up doing a lot of the work over. Uh, again, uh, I would look closely at the hybrid option, which I'll cover next, to see if that can work for me instead. So what is the hybrid model? The hybrid mo model is what we here call the buy and build model. And this is uh, not something we have invented. This is a model that we see a number of software comp companies have adopted. Uh, and we are seeing that this is being becoming more mainstream among non-software companies too, the telecom companies, um, or just many other companies uh, uh, that the manufacturing companies and all that. They, their core business is not software, but but this is becoming a way that they are uh, implementing systems in-house. Uh, so this approach of buying the capability uh, and customizing it. Uh, to your needs and integrating it with their product. That's what this hybrid model is. So the, the idea is that you buy some, some, work, some software, uh, it has to be the right kind of software, and then that software allows you to customize it uh, so that it works just the way you need it to work uh, with the right workflows and everything else, and then you integrate it uh, with, your, with your product. So this won't work with just any software out there in the market. You really have to uh, specifically look for certain capabilities in that software. So uh, I mentioned earlier that there are some considerations that apply well to this hybrid paradigm. And these include, uh, let's see, the making the capability look the same as your application. So basically making sure that your application looks completely seamless, even though you have embedded a, a third party or a vendor a product inside it, or if it has a specialized workflow. You, I, I spoke about control of technologies uh, used in the feature and really some complex integration challenges where you're working against maybe some legacy system. So what this requires then is the product that you are buying has to have features that allow it to be easily integrated into that parent product. So that means the, these features must be completely configurable, uh, completely themable, which means you'll be able to change the look, the styles, and all those things. Uh, it has to be flexible, which means that you should be able to have the, uh, the uh, able to change the UX of the application, the workflows, uh, so that they match more of what you're offering in your in your product. And the feature must be extensible, so which means you are able to write custom code that allows you to uh, work through your unique and complex integration challenges. So in these situations, uh, these all end up favoring the hybrid buy and build model, uh, especially when you want to embed analytics into your, into your software so that the analytics are completely seamless uh, with the rest of the application, uh, that your end users can't really tell that they are actually getting the analytics from a different product. And that's where the hybrid model really shines. 
So uh, at this point, uh, let me switch this over to Michael McLaughlin, uh, Director of Data Analytics at CPSI, and he's going to talk about his experiences in embedding analytics into his applications. Thank you, Nat. Uh, could you go ahead and switch to the next slide? Thanks. Uh, so, yeah, as Nat mentioned, uh, my name is Michael McLaughlin. I'm with CPSI. Uh, CPSI is a healthcare IT provider. We're actually based in Mobile, Alabama, but we do now have offices uh, throughout the continental United States. The company started here in Mobile in 1979, and we're now uh, have employees in the 2000 and above range. Our primary customers are healthcare uh, providers, so we are uh, primarily an acute care uh, software provider. So we have 900 uh, small rural and community hospitals that are our primary customers. And we also have three over 3,000 post-acute facilities as well as CPSI customers to include nursing homes and long-term care facilities. So our challenge was we needed a BI solution. Uh, basically, we needed a solution to be able to provide dashboards to our customers within our electronic health record applications. Uh, the application is one that we provide to hospitals and post-acute care facilities and really try to make it an all-in-one application where a, a healthcare facility can provide everything uh, that they need from an internal operation standpoint to include payroll and general ledger all the way to uh, the patient care and the, and the bedside, so to speak, uh, for nurses and physicians to do all their documentation and, and work in there. So everything can be done within the system. And we needed some way to tie in analytics to really be able to give things uh, give everybody a dashboard view to to have a top-down view of what's going on within the facility, what needs to be done, and, and where are things trending. And traditionally, all of our development's been internal. You know, I, I mentioned the company uh, founded in 1979, and almost all of our software applications were built uh, from within. You know, we didn't have a lot of partnerships up to this point. And we actually did create a dashboard application, but it did have some limited functionality. So it was it was a dashboard of, of graph, graphs that were images only, uh, very little interaction, and so it was really just kind of a, a standalone uh, set of pictures, so to speak. Uh, Michael, I'll jump in and ask a question here. So uh, when you, when your team, your original team, uh, uh, when they built that, uh, that dashboard, the internal dashboard, did they make an assessment of available analytics products before they made that decision, or was it just they just went straight to the build decision? Uh, in the initial phases, we actually went straight to the build decision. Uh, the idea was discussed, and we really kind of looked at a few open source platforms. Um, but again, ultimately, up to that point, we had been a, an in-house uh, development group uh, almost entirely. And so the initial decision was almost an easy one that we knew. We, we're a development company. We Software is our thing, and we were going to build this tool. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I see that a lot, actually. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so, from your from for for this uh, pro this product that you build, this dashboard application, how much time did it actually take for your team to for the for the team to build that solution? Uh, I'd say well over uh, probably just over twelve months was the was the build time from from initial design to having a uh, marketable product. Uh, but again, that product was a a, a oper operable dashboard application, but with limited functionality, uh, such as I mentioned with just the images, uh, but it was about 12 months to build. All right, thank you. So where that decision changed, uh, we were just talking about, you know, we knew we were going to build because that's what we do. We're a software company, uh, but we actually acquired another healthcare IT provider, uh, formerly a competitor of CPSI as we acquired them, and thus we acquired their software as well. Uh, so that's where the two new applications came in. So at that point, we knew that we wanted to be able to deliver RBI content to all CPSI customers now, not just the ones that were running our legacy primary product. Uh, so we did a little bit of research, and we ultimately knew that this meant not just embedding uh, a tool of some sort into multiple applications, but also connecting to disparate data sources as well. So we knew that we now had three applications. We had the traditional CPSI application. We had the new uh, acute hospital application through our, our acquisition. And we had the post-acute uh, nursing home application that also came with the same acquisition. So we had all these different moving pieces and we needed to try to evaluate, could we leverage our built tool into three different uh, base, base applications or did we need to look at some other option? And ultimately we decided we needed to look at some other option. And we did take an initial look at numerous vendors, uh, some of the more popular ones you'll see out there, you know, Tableau, Information Builders, Burst, Sysense, Pentaho, and Logi. 
and ultimately Logi was the one who lined up best with our functionality and our licensing requirements as well as our infrastructure. So what types of functionality were you looking for that your homegrown solution did not have? Right, so we knew we wanted the, obviously the basic dashboard that we were able to provide, uh, you know, is a very static screen up to six images, but no more than six images. So, but it was, it stopped there. It was a, a static image. There was no interaction with the image, no hover capability, no zoom capability. Uh, we could click on the image as a whole. As an example, you could be looking at a bar graph and you could click anywhere on the graph to go launch to a new report or something like that, but you could not provide an any sort of interaction within, you know, click on a given bar or a given line of a line chart or something like that to learn more information about that specific series. So we wanted a lot of those, what really seems like intuitive basic dashboard functionality to include that kind of hover over the drill through on a series, uh, zooming on a chart, things like that. Uh, and then obviously once we started our search, we realized all the additional functionalities that could come with a purchase product to include not just building dashboards, but building reports, offering self-service capabilities, things like that. And uh, what were the key criteria behind your decision, your, your final decision here? Uh, the first was ease of use, and by ease of use, I really mean for the development team that would be building the tool, not so much for the end user. Obviously, that's a huge concern as well, uh, but we wanted a tool that we could get in and build with quickly. We didn't want to spend another six months or a year just learning how to use a tool before we could even build anything with it. Uh, we wanted to make sure it fit our, our kind of our corporate licensing model. Uh, as a software provider, we do not typically, we don't license by user, uh, we license to facilities as a whole. So if we sell an application, we set a fee uh, for an entire hospital or something in this case, and, and we don't adjust that, we don't track by user, things like that. So we really wanted something that, that played well with that licensing model, uh, which a lot of the comp competition did not. Um, and our infrastructure. Uh, we're, we're traditionally a Linux house. Uh, all of our primary applications are Linux based and run on Linux operating systems. And so some of the competitors required a Windows environment. Uh, so that definitely did not meet with our needs as well. All right. So as a result, uh, you know, I mentioned we didn't want to spend a year learning. Uh, we uh, have pretty aggressively moved to a marketable product, uh, which this timeline outlines. We actually partnered with Logi Analytics in uh, very late September of 2016. Uh, and then there's a jump there from September to January. But really that time was was filled with, you know, everybody had, we had holiday obligations and other scheduling obligations, and we conducted some some evaluations with Logi, but we didn't actually officially begin our training for our development group until January of 2017. So from that time in January 2017, having had no experience other than trials and some online, you know, just kind of playing with the tool, uh, we went from, I think the second week of January, to having a fully embedded product in two out of our, those three healthcare applications, uh, each having a full dashboard application in just about four months. And then in mid-May of that of this year, just a couple months ago, we demoed this to our user, our user base to rave reviews. We did this at our annual conference in Florida, uh, where we had uh, well over a thousand users in attendance. And then we are planning this very month uh, to begin implementation at our hospitals. That's pretty exciting. Uh, so a uh, quick question here. Did the effort take a lot of development resources? Uh, it really didn't. Uh, you know, myself, I've been involved with the project from the beginning, but I am not uh, by trade a developer. Uh, we had two additional developers go through the Logi training along with myself. And really it's been a team of two and we, we've added one developer just in the last month or two. Uh, so, so I would say two full-time developers uh, plus another one just in the last month or two, uh, we're able to build the entire tool. And that's that's the work done in Logi itself. We, of course, had other resources uh, on the application end. I say the application end being the CPSI applications that worked on the embedding process simultaneously, and we were able to do, uh, do everything, uh, you know, in conjunction with each other, uh, but really only two or three people doing the Logi work. So just to reiterate a point I made earlier, I'll ask you that question. So did you see a benefit to your company around the opportunity cost? Since you clearly used fewer resources and less time, did that mean you now had resources to devoted and available to devote your uh, core product? It did, it did, yeah. So when we built our own tool, we had to use the people who know that tool, um, you know, who knew our, our base application and the languages used there for the development. So we, we were taking up two or three or, or more at times development resources from our primary application, which is our core business. Uh, but to use the Logi tool, uh, it, 
we were able to actually kind of create a new development team entirely, taking people from other departments that did not uh, require, that were not assigned to our core product. And these were people more like that had other skill sets such as uh, really just SQL developers and things like that instead of our primary Java developers. Uh, and they were able to get in there and, and do the development in Logi so that the other development resources could maintain their roles working on the uh, core application. So that that's how I just mentioned we were able to continue the effort simultaneously while our development group here in the data analytics division built out the Logi tool that was going to be in, uh, ultimately embedded in the other products. Those other product teams were able to not just do their daily job, but do the what ultimately is very little uh, legwork on the application side to do the embedding so that now our Logi application is fully embedded within two out of our three healthcare applications that we provide. Excellent. Thanks, Michael, and uh, best Welcome. of luck with your implementation uh, going forward. I'm sure it's going to be quite an exciting time. It yeah, very, very much is. Thank <laughs> you. So let's uh, talk about the key takeaways then. Um, so the, the question here is build, buy, or both, and uh, we've given use cases for which you would want to uh, do, you, you would build or you would buy. And uh, Michael's example was excellent because it illustrated the complexities uh, that, that, that are involved in the process and all the, uh, all the decisions that have to be made and why, in this case, the buy approach uh, won over the build approach. Uh, that by no means means that, that buy is always better. Uh, it is, you, there are many, many cases where build will win out. And I, I mentioned some of these before. The, the, if the feature is really core IP for your business, then you really should be building it. Uh, if the feature provides a competitive advantage, it's quite different from anything else in the market and you want to, want to uh, stay ahead of your, your, your uh, competitors in this, then uh, that feature, you probably want to build that feature. Uh, but then there are other things where build comes out ahead, unless you talk about a hybrid approach. Things like the, the, the having domain-specific workflows and UI UX that are completely integrated, uh, control of the technology, uh, into, if, if the integration with your product is complex. In those situations, build has an advantage uh, in general. Now, buy works if you want to keep the cost low and if you want to deliver quickly. And I think you saw both of those uh, in, in Michael's example. Uh, as you're, and, and in his case, the requirements were complex too. They were definitely more complex than what, what he had before uh, when, he had, when they had tried to build that, their solution. Uh, but uh, other things that where it helps out is if you want to uh, simplify your go-to-market. And finally, the last point, I, I really want to uh, emphasize that if your teams don't have the necessary skills in the product management team or the development team, or this feature specific knowledge, you're probably better off buying because otherwise you'll spend a lot of time recreating existing expertise, which is awfully expensive. So the hybrid option, I mentioned that separately as being a great option. Uh, it, it takes away, uh, it, it includes, it gives you a, a certain level of control as a product company since the inclination for product companies is always, we build software, so let's go and build this out. Uh, but by having this buy option and build buy and finding a, an appropriate software vendor who can work with you, uh, it, is, uh, it, it really makes this a much more powerful option. But uh, I do want to stress on something that Michael mentioned. And the first one is uh, whether the, it's important that you get the appropriate licensing terms. Uh, and that, that's really quite critical. Buy can, and I know I said buy is cheaper, but buy can quickly become expensive if the licensing is not right. If you're a software company with a thousand customers or even a hundred customers and each customer has a hundred users, then your overall number of users really gets straight into the thousands, tens, or even the hundreds of thousands. If you're licensing by user, buy will become prohibitively expensive. It makes no sense at all to buy in that situation. So make sure that if you're going through this process that you work through the licensing terms early on in the process and make sure that they're amenable to your style of development where you can say pay by customer, by, by, by customer or by server rather than by the number of end users. The other point I'll mention here is that uh, uh, you do want to keep track of the roadmap of your vendor. So if your vendor's roadmap aligns well with yours, if the features they, are, they have in the product are, are things that you will plan to add in your roadmap, or if they're adding in new features that align with what you're trying to do uh, with your, your uh, uh, implementation and deployment, uh, then you can be sure that you, you are future-proofing your decision. So uh, just make sure, again, uh, this is no one-size-fits-all fits answer. Uh, for different companies, every single one of these is a different consideration. They will give different weightage to these things. So it's important to keep all these considerations in mind when making that build, buy, or both decision. 
I will finish this off to, and see uh, uh, with, with this statement about uh, uh, a demo that we have. If you're interested in seeing a demo of a product which illustrates how to embed analytics into your application, you can do so by going to this link over here. Uh, and at this point in time, I will open this up for Q&A. Thank you, uh, Nat and Michael. Excellent uh, presentation. Uh, at this time, I would like to remind our attendees that they can ask a question by going to the question pane in the control panel, typing it in, and hitting submit. Uh, so just to uh, kick things off, uh, Nat, I guess this is for you. What are some of the capabilities users are requesting in an analytics kind of solution? So, in, so actually, Michael uh, illustrated a number of those, or he, he spoke about a number of those. So typically, uh, at, the, at the simplest level, people will ask interactions. So uh, they want their users to be go, able to interact with charts, either drill or, or navigate to a different page and things like that. As the requirements uh, get more complex, as the, the, the solution becomes more mature, people start demanding things like self-service. And, and self-service analytics is really the ability to go and build out uh, for users to be able to go and uh, access a data set, a curated data set. They're, this is really something that's managed by their IT department or something so that they only see the data they're supposed to see. And then go and build out their own reports and dashboards to do their own analysis of the data, to go look through the data and try to find useful information. So those are the kinds of things that people typically ask for analytics uh, when it comes to analytics. Uh, this is what the broad majority, I should say, of the users are looking for. Excellent. OK, uh, things moving. Another question. Uh, what are the advantages and disadvantages of using an open source solution? So open source is um, a tricky uh, option. Uh, it, has a, it has significant advantages. Uh, with open source, you know what you're getting, for one thing. It's cheap for the most part. Uh, under, so sometimes uh, if the open source component is a GPL license, then it, it does cause problems. But in most cases, it's usually Apache or MIT licenses. And, and that's really very convenient. Uh, so open source is really beneficial. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, they're quite cutting edge, uh, especially with the most popular op open source components out there. Uh, there are some significant drawbacks that need to be kept in mind. And these are not things that you think about when you first go about that open source decision. Uh, so the first thing is um, that these things are often targeted for vulnerabilities. Uh, so when the security has become a big deal, and I see this almost in every call I have with my customers or, or with our prospects, is, is what, how, how secure is your, is your platform. And uh, when it comes to open source, uh, that's where people tend to probe the most. Uh, another part is that uh, uh, possible deficiencies that you really have to keep up to date with the latest versions of the open source software. Uh, one of the challenges we see that, uh, that our customers run into is if, this, if you're using open source components, uh, they, uh, if they don't keep it up to date. There's some vulnerability, again, that will come into play, and it'll get flagged by some vulnerability, uh, uh, penetration testing tool as, as a potential vulnerability. And then you had to spend time and resources explaining that, hey, this is true or this is not true. So it really eats up a lot of time from that perspective. And uh, there's, there's also the, the possibility that it ends up having too many forks or um, if, it, if it's not properly community driven, the, the components that you choose, especially there's so many new open source components coming out today, uh, that they, um, they, the, it, it can get canned or this, it gets outdated. Uh, the versions get outdated and it's no longer backwards compatible. So those are some of the challenges with using open source uh, components. Very good. Uh, okay, looks like I have another question uh, here. So what are the branding considerations when you buy? Do you end up being an advertisement for your vendor? So um, typically, that's where you have to make your decision. So uh, the answer is, it depends on the product you buy. Uh, some vendors out in the market will say, you do have to brand us since you're embedding us in your product, in, into, into your product. So uh, in that case, yes, uh, you are telling everybody that you, you're using that vendor. Uh, but if if I were you, if if uh, you are, if I have to advise you on purchasing software, I would look for vendors who allow you to white label, and what this means is then then you can embed that uh, that component. And this is something I probably should have covered earlier on uh, in my presentation. White label la labeling is pretty important because if you want that seamless look and feel of the application and how it interacts with everything else you're offering in your in your software product. You don't want to make sure that it's white label. You don't want people to say, oh, no, that's something completely different. It'll just end up with more questions uh, during the, 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 the 
prospect phase when you're trying to acquire a customer and you'll have more concerns from customers after they've purchased your product about uh, what the future of that, that, that other vendor is going to be. All right, it looks like um, we're getting close to the end of time, but we have time for another question. Uh, and uh, the question is, does the Lodge platform offer data level and user-specific security? Um, it does. Uh, um, and in this case, uh, it, 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 uh, it's, it really provides a very flexible security uh, model. So it allows both row and column level security. It allows uh, you to configure, and this is all configurable. It has what, what I like to call personally, it's not a real industry term, but it's, it has what I call digest security. So if you have a parent application, and that parent application is, say, LDAP or Active Directory or something like that, uh, Logi has the ability to go and, and digest that or just consume that uh, as, as a security, and you won't have to recreate that security, those security options. And when, when it comes to uh, authentication, and uh, sorry, authorization of what you see on the screen, you actually have very fine-grained control with Logi of looking at all those, uh, uh, making sure that different users can get different views based on their security permissions. And I'll just add to that really quickly, Nat, that uh, we do use uh, Logi security uh, in the application we built. You know, again, as I mentioned, our Logi application is completely embedded within our, our healthcare record and being in the healthcare world, uh, security is paramount. Uh, so we do have security settings uh, within our parent applications and we simply pass those through when, when the Logi application is called and we can reference our same role types and things of that nature in our Logi application to control who has access to what data. So it's very, very easy to set up. Okay, that's great. Uh, all right, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank both uh, Nat and Michael for uh, for leading this presentation today. And of course, thank uh, Logi Analytics who sponsored the, this presentation. Uh, and until next time, I'm Dave Rubenstein, Editor-in-Chief of SD Times. So long, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you, Dave.